So welcome back everyone uh, to this uh, second session again on macroprudential policy effectiveness. So I'm very happy to have here with me the first speaker, that's Celine de Schreider. She's assistant professor at Kent University and has research interests in monetary policy and macroprudential policies with a, for, with a focus on borrower-based measures, as, uh, as I understand. And uh, she will, her paper will be discussed by um, Sona Bashkaya, who is lecturer at the University of Glasgow and had, has lots of experience at the Central Bank of Turkey in various functions. So, um, Celine, the floor is yours. Okay, good day to everyone. I'm very happy to be able to present this joint work with uh, Lara Collier, who's also present in the audience today, just in front there. Um, so this paper is about trying to evaluate the effects of national macroprudential policies related to the housing market on house price growth rate. So more specifically, we want to find out whether there are heterogeneous effects of national macroprudential policy actions targeting the housing market which are being implemented by the National Bank of Belgium on house price growth rate at the local level. So that's the idea of this paper. So let me then continue with providing you our research focus. So the question we would like to answer is the following, whether and to which extent those housing sector specific macroprudential policy tools have heterogeneous effects on these local house price growth rate and if we find them, then which factors could drive that heterogeneity? It's not only about finding heterogeneous effects, but also trying to see what's, what drives these effects. And we put a focus on heterogeneity or potential heterogeneity being driven by um, local housing market characteristics and household financing conditions in those local housing markets. So the motivation for this research question is based on the related literature where we typically see mixed findings on the effects of these tools on house prices in the aggregate, meaning that typically people have been finding negative small effects or insignificant effects, but it might be that those aggregate impacts are blurred because of heterogeneity, because we know from the literature that housing markets are segmented in nature and they also respond differently, or they are differently sensitive to common shocks. Um, and apart from that, there's also a policy relevance in the fact that whenever we find heterogeneity of these implementations on local housing markets, that this might have distributional effects, which is of course uh, very important uh, for politics, but also for policymakers more generally. So, these housing sector related macroprudential tools are being used to dampen the so-called vicious feedback loops between the housing market, financial intermediaries and the real economy. And they take different form, but essentially they want to improve the resilience of financial institutions to housing market volatility. And they take different forms in the sense that it can be capital requirements that try to have a direct impact on this resilience but also these borrower-based tools, which more or less have an indirect impact on the resilience of financial institutions, where we have the LTV caps that try to put an entry barrier in the housing market in order to reduce the share of uh, risky borrowers in the mortgage market. But we also have the debt to income, loan to income, debt service to income limits, which try to reduce the vulnerability of households throughout the mortgage. And by reducing this vulnerability of households to um, yeah, negative shocks affecting the economy, also the resilience of financial institutions can be improved. What we are aiming for, however, is not this impact on the resilience of financial institutions, but the um, impact on house prices, because typically these, yeah, these measures have been popular in the sense that monetary policymakers have implemented um, have implemented them relatively often, but at the same time, the main focus in terms of effectiveness of these tools 
has been on this resilience of financial institutions, whereas we know that also house prices can be affected because it's, uh, these tools have an impact on the financial uh, conditions of households and financial conditions are the most important driver of house prices. So we, in this paper, really want to focus on the effects on house price growth rates and uh, so over and above this um, yeah, effect on the resilience of financial institutions. So we want to make uh, two points first uh, for the reason of potential heterogeneity uh, on the effects of house prices. First is that housing markets uh, are known to be um, to have a local nature. Uh, house prices are driven by uh, many demand and supply factors, and typically these factors vary at the level of uh, the local housing markets. But also we want to take into account that macroprudential policy does not merely target the overall uh, mortgage market, but specifically the high risk segment of that housing market. So also there, there could be heterogeneity driven by this uh, specific segment of the housing market. So what we do is that we will use, in order to determine these effects on local house prices, we will use municipality level data from Belgium. Um, and this uh, for the sample period running from 2012 till 2020. So before I continue with uh, an explanation of how we measure uh, the main variables, being macroprudential policy and house prices, I want to uh, first give some further information on the Belgian experience in terms of these housing market related policy tools over the time frame we consider. And basically, the Belgian implementations concern three different actions in this uh, time period. The first one in December 2013, where there was a capital uh, requirement, namely a fixed or a flat uh, five percentage point add-on to the risk waste uh, for banks using an internal rate-based model. So this was just an, um, a capital requirement imposed on these financial institutions. And the second one was uh, introduced in April 2018, where um, there was actually a, a strengthening of this uh, risk weight requirement, where next to the targeted component, which is again this 5% add-on, uh, we also now had a sensitive uh, or a risk sensitive component, which is based on the micro risk weights of the uh, portfolio of residential real estate uh, of Belgium and then multiplied by a factor of 1.33. So this, the aim at this stage, or at that stage, was to, um, to, to further stimulate banks to um, reduce the extent of high-risk borrowers, the, the high-risk share in the mortgage market, because that was considered to remain too high despite that initial risk rate measure. And then the, the third one was introduced or effective since January 2020, and that are the borrower-based tools, namely prudential expectations on banks and insurance companies, uh, which uh, imposes a cap on the LTV ratio of 90% for owner-occupied housing and 80% of buy-to-let loans, albeit sometimes in combination with a debt-to-income and debt-service-to-income ratios, where then we have the cap on the LTV ratio of 90% combined with DTI ratio of nine and a DSTI ratio of uh, a DSTI limit of 50%. So basically three different macroprudential actions oriented specifically at risk arising from the uh, Belgian residential real estate markets. If we take a look at average house price growth rates during this period, we see that similar to many other European countries, these have been increasing over time. So what you can see on this figure is growth rates for the three different regions of Belgium, being Flanders, Wallonia and Brussels. And then the, um, the weighted sum for the entire country, Belgium, in, uh, in blue. And basically what you see is this rising trend over time in average house price growth rate, which uh, has some variation across the regions, but um, yeah, the evolution is fairly similar. 
Then I want to come about, uh, to the measurement of house prices on the one hand and macroprudential policy tools on the other hand. And um, the, the most important thing to, to notice about measuring house price growth rates for our paper is that we use a hedonic house price index. We use data from a work of uh, Rusens and Coauter. And yeah, there are many technical details associated to the use of a hedonic house price index. But the most important reason to use it here is that it allows to take into account the fact that the type of properties that is being sold in a certain period, that that can change quite drastically over time. And this hedonic house price index allows to pick up changes in the type of properties that are being sold over time because we specifically control for characteristics of the dwellings. So it allows us to come to a measure of price changes for the average dwelling in the economy of Belgium. So this, this means that it has the benefits of um, leading to much lower volatility compared to a house price index, which is based on transaction prices. And, and that's a huge benefit. But at the same time, it also has a drawback because we move from quarterly frequency with transaction prices to annual frequency with the hedonic house price index. And because of, so that leads to less observations. And also because of the fact that we want to use this hedonic house price index, we have to uh, remove certain transactions because not all information about these housing characteristics is available for each single transaction um, in the Belgian economy. So, whereas we have a measure which has much less volatility compared to house price index based on transaction prices, we have to move to annual frequency and we have a lower number of observations due to missing data on housing uh, characteristics. Um, on the other hand, we still find that if we look at uh, this, um, this house price index based on hedonic prices, that even in case, or even that uh, taking into account that even with this hedonic house price index, there is a re reduction of volatility. Even in that case, we see that for small municipalities, there's still quite a lot of uh, volatility in this index. And this is being driven by a low number of transactions. So for that reason, we clean this uh, house price index further by removing those municipalities from the sample which have a number of housing transactions in a given uh, over the entire period which is below the 10 percentile for the entire group of municipalities so we we come to so we arrive to a measure of um, house price evolutions which takes into account the composition of houses being sold but on the other hand is also uh, very nice to interpret um, and here I want to show the, um, the, I want to visualize the extent of cross-sectional variation because we use hedonic house prices to have a good sense of how house prices move over time, taking into account the composition of houses being sold. But we also noticed in our data sets that for the 497 municipalities we are um, having in our sample, that there's a lot of cross-sectional variation in terms of the ranking of the municipalities over time. So it's not just that we have variation over time in house price growth rates at the local level, but we also notice that there's cross-sectional variation changing over time. And these um, figures visualize this cross-sectional variation over time by providing you a picture of the map of Belgium with the different municipalities uh, for, the three, uh, for three years in our sample, being the first year 2012, the last year 2020, and the middle year 2016. And what you can notice here is that, uh, so the color scheme represents quantiles of the distributions of house price growth rate in a given year. So we move from red to dark green, where red signals the lowest quantile of house price growth rate, and dark green is the highest quantile of house price growth rates in that specific year. And we notice that there is substantial variation, and typically, me and Lara give the example of Knokke, which is the most eastern uh, country at the coast there. Uh, which is red in the first year, 2012, with a growth rate of minus 3%, 2016, 
turns orange in the middle year, 2016, with a growth rate of 0.5%, and then pops up to be in the dark green area in the last year with a growth rate of 17%. Of course, that's a pandemic year. We're talking about a municipality at the coast, so a lot of demand for second homes, of course. In terms of measuring macroprudential policy, we make use of a macroprudential policy index. And this index is based on the typical dummy being used in the literature, where we have values of minus one, zero, and plus one, where minus one refers to loosening actions, zero to neutral actions and plus one to tightening actions. So this dummy provides a very um, clean, elegant way to inform us about the timing and the direction of the change of macroprudential policies. But what it doesn't do, do is uh, giving an indication about the intensity of those macroprudential policy decisions. And therefore we use an intensity-based index of a macroprudential policy, which is based on uh, earlier work of me and Lara. So I don't have the time to go into the details here, but basically we take into account the scope of each policy action, the quantitative restriction of each policy action, and the legal enforceability to be informed about the exact intensity of the measure over and above the timing and the direction of the change. Okay, and this leads to the following um, figure where we present the cumulative changes so uh, the risk weights in 2013, the uh, increases in 2018 and 2020 associated with the borrower-based tools. Yeah, and here I normally also want to show the additional graph to say that in the econometric analysis, we take the changes of these macroprudential policy measures which uh, are, um, and we take them together in one way. So we, 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 we take together the risk weight weather measures and the borrower-based tools in one series in order to pick up macroprudential policy changes targeting the housing market in our, um, in our sample. So having explained the two basic series and how we measure them, so house prices and macroprudential policy, I now want to outline our baseline model um, estimation. So what we have here is um, a dynamic fixed effects model uh, where our dependent variable YIRT represents local house price growth rate. So house price growth rate in municipality I, region R, at year T. We regress that on its leg, um, a measure of explanatory variables at the local level, and then an interaction terms that picks up this macroprudential policy indicator, um, where uh, that's kind of the tool, this beta coefficient, where we want to measure those potential heterogeneous effects of macroprudential policy affecting local house price growth rates. We take into account municipality level uh, fixed effects, time fixed effects, and region time times uh, fixed effects to pick up any other confounding factors. So to repeat, we have almost 500 Belgian municipalities in our sample, and we have a time frame running from 2012 to 2020. So we use a dynamic, or we estimate a dynamic panel with fixed effects. Um, this means that we have to take into account the nickel bias on the coefficient of the lag-dependent variable, and we do that via a uh, jackknife bias correction approach, uh, which um, is shown to alleviate the concerns even in small t-samples. So first is x variables. So what we want to do with it is controlling for local drivers of house price growth rates, being three measures of demand at the local level and one supply measure. So demand uh, side measures are uh, changes in per capita income, changes in employment, and changes in the number of households relative to the number of total residents to pick up demographic factors uh, changing over time. And as a supply determinant, we use the number of houses relative to the number of residents and exactly the growth rate of that variable. Um, our interest lies, of course, in the coefficients on the interaction terms. So we interact as macroprudential policy changes with indicators of financially constrained and high risk borrowers, with um, a measure of activity in the local housing market. 
and the degree of household indebtedness also at the local level, so at the municipal level. So let's explain this in more detail. So first, we interact macroprudential policy changes with this measure of um, high-risk borrowers, residents in these local housing markets. And we focus on uh, different variables based on literature. We focus on the share of low-income uh, inhabitants, the share of first-time buyers, the share of overdue credit relative to total mortgage credit, uh, outstanding credit to young people, share of single-person households and single-parent households. So that are all indicators that signal high-risk borrowers or increased financial constraints. We also include the share of highly educated young people, and this is then a measure of residents being less constrained because it are typically those borrowers at the age of buying a first house, which are less constrained because of their relatively high education. Important to note is that we consider these variables to vary across these local housing markets, so across these municipalities, but they are taken to be constant in time and they are predetermined. And this to, um, to, to limit reverse causality, namely the fact that those factors could also drive house price growth rates. The second type of variable that we use in this interaction terms with macroprudential policy changes is this hotness indicator where we take into account the number or the growth in the number of housing transactions relative to the number of residents in that local housing market. And the idea here is that we want to see whether the hotness of a local housing market matters for the impact of macroprudential policy changes on local house price growth rate. And then the third measure of these interaction terms is household indebtedness at the local level, where we want to pick up whether higher debt of households leading to higher risky position in that local housing market has an additional impact on the effectiveness of macroprudential policy, again, on local house price growth rates. So the hypothesis that we make here is that if you have local housing markets with more financially constrained high-risk residents or borrowers, that that will lead to an additional downward effect of macroprudential policy changes um, uh, of a macroprudential policy tightening. Secondly, we conjecture, consistent with um, findings in the literature, that whenever you have a hot local housing market, that that would lead to an additional downward impact of macroprudential policy changes on local house prices. And third, we hypothesize that when you have increased household indebtedness at the local level, that again, you have a larger downward effect of macroprudential policy tightenings on these house price growth rates. So let's take a look at our findings, our empirical estimates. So the table that I show you here is um, giving you the coefficients when we interact each variable separately. And from column three to column eight onwards, you notice that all indicators of financially constrained borrowers, residents, that those have a negative impact, so an additional negative impact of tightening macroprudential policy. They are all negative, and except for the share of single parent households, they are also significant. If we look at the first two columns, however, we do, we do not find significant coefficients. So the first column shows you the result of trying to find out whether a hot housing market leads to additional downward effects of tightening macroprudential policy. The sign is consistent with our conjecture, but it's not significant. In the second column, we do not find a significant coefficient for the impact of the uh, growth in household indebtedness in that local housing market, but it also has the opposite sign because it's positive. The reason here is that what we are capturing with our measure of household indebtedness, which is the, uh, the amount of uh, mortgage credit, the number of mortgage credits per resident, it's the extensive margin of household debt. So we do not pick up the intensive margin of household debt. And of course, that's 
yeah, most that's what you want to capture the amount or the change in risky debt position in your local housing market. And that's probably the reason why we don't find a significant coefficient with the right sign. Uh, me and Lara, we spent quite a lot of time trying to find a measure of the um, intensive margin of household debt, but that data is simply not available at the micro level. It's simply not available in the credit registry. And yeah, if uh, the discussant, for example, has some advice, uh, we would be very happy to hear that. That being said, what is probably more interesting is to look at the estimates when we combine different um, interaction variables. And here you again notice in the first graph that we find this positive but all, almost zero coefficient for the hotness of the local housing market. And again, an insignificant uh, positive coefficient for this uh, indebtedness indicator. For column two, what we did there is combining the indicators of financially constrained borrowers being share of credit to young people and the share of highly educated young people within that local municipality. And we find the share of credit to young people to continuously be negative and significant, so having an additional negative impact of macroprudential policy tightening on local house price growth rates. But this seems to be counteracted by this measure of highly educated young people or the presence of those people in the local market, which is consistent with our conjecture that those are the people who are less constrained. Even controlling for the amount of young people highly educated in that local municipality, we still find a negative coefficient of the share of uh, credit going to young, uh, to young people in that uh, municipality. The third column informs you about our different indicators of risky positions in the mortgage market. So it picks up the share of first time buyers in mortgage credit in that municipality, the share of credit to young people, so young people being between 24 and, and 35, and the share of overdue credits. For all these indicators, we find, positive, uh, we find negative but significant coefficients even when we combine them. If we then look at column four, there um, we take together all the indicators of financially constrained residents, except for share of overdue credit and the share of, um, of single households, because there's too much correlation with other indicators. We have correlation being consistently above 70%, so we remove them uh, in this column. But what you can see here is that if we combine those different terms, that we continue to have negative coefficients for each of these indicators, but the significance um, drops or falls away for the share of first-time buyers and the share of single-parent households. So, and then column five takes together all these indicators together with the ones in the, the first column. So what we infer from this table is that, okay, I'll continue. So uh, an alternative approach that we took to try to find out whether this is all, there's an, uh, an impact of activity in housing markets at the local level is to use a quantile regression approach where we can make our beta coefficient depending on the hotness of the local housing market. And we do this via quantile regression approach because it uh, allows us to take the distribution of the dependent variable and makes our coefficients depending on that distribution. And house price growth rates means that if you take the left tail of the distribution, you're in a, hot, you're in a cold housing market. If you take the right tail of the distribution, you are in a hot housing market. So this allows us to make all of our coefficients depending on being in a hot or cold housing market in a specific year. So I don't have time to go to the details of, um, of, of our results, but what we find is that these measures of financially constrained, um, of financial constrained residents continue to impact local house price growth rate in a negative way, but along the activity of local housing markets, there seems to be different effects. I guess I don't have the time to discuss this anymore, so I will just leave you with my conclusion slide, namely geographic heterogeneity seems to matter 
there is a heterogeneous impact of national macrofinancial tools on local house prices. And uh, this seems to be different. These effects seem to differ across cold versus hot housing markets. So conclusion that we take from that is that it matters for policymakers to look at those heterogeneous effects because they can have distributional consequences as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabine. Okay, um, thank you very much. Thank you to the organizers to, for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. I found this paper very interesting and very timely. Uh, let me very briefly uh, summarize uh, what uh, Lara and Celine did and then give you my suggestions and some observations. So the paper is analyzing the uh, heterogeneous effects of borrower-based macroprudential policies targeting the house market. But where is the key heterogeneity we are interested in? Uh, whether high, um, so uh, it's a municipal level uh, data that the uh, paper is using and they are focusing on whether the municipalities with higher share of risky borrowers, later defined, uh, indebted households, or uh, municipalities with uh, uh, high uh, housing, local housing uh, market activity, face a heterogeneous impact after macroprudential tightening in Belgium. So the authors are using the data between 2012 and 2020, using municipal level hedonic prices. They use the macroprudential policies uh, taken by National Bank of Belgium 2014, 18, and then recent loan to value debt uh, service to income ratio and uh, debt, debt to income ratio adjustments in 2020. Um, the analysis is municipal level. So all these heterogeneities, when we talk about the risky borrowers, when we talk about indebted households, all the heterogeneities going through the uh, share of risky households, uh, for example, defined as share of young households, uh, single parent households, uh, or low income households, uh, or uh, when we talk about the indebtedness, it's again share of uh, overdue credits or share of outstanding credits at the municipal level. Uh, and the paper uh, also tries to control for, um, again, using municipal level data, the terms of demand and supply. So the basic motivation is, first of all, we all know that the housing markets are segmented. There are local dynamics. There are lots of uh, local factors affecting the housing prices. And then uh, the question is, um, in response to macro production, macroeconomic policies in general, it may be fiscal policy, or in particular case of macro prudential policies, are there also local dynamics due to these uh, different uh, characteristics? But it's also related to the recent discussions about whether the uh, macroeconomic policies and in particular macro prudential policy uh, leads to uh, some distributional effects through the focus on the housing prices. So the basic model is, um, so the paper is uh, addressing only the annual changes in the uh, hedonic house price indices, where uh, the key, it, it controls for uh, factors affecting demand and supply. But the key thing there is the beta coefficient that they're trying to estimate. And I use slightly little, uh, different notation uh, it is the coefficient in front of the uh, intensely adjusted macroprudential policy that Selin uh, described in detail, and the local market conditions uh, that I uh, mentioned uh, a moment ago, like share of young households, share of low-income households, share of indebted households, and the uh, key hypothesis is whether this beta uh, is in a way that suggests the tightening leads to a larger decline in the housing price growth in areas characterized by risky or indebted uh, uh, households plus uh, where the labor uh, the housing market activity is already high. And they use for municipality time and regional uh, time fixed effects. The key findings is yes, they do find the heterogeneous impact. In particular, they see uh, they observe higher decline in house price growth in locations 
with higher share of low income households, young people, single households, first time buyers and overdue credits. And later with the quantile uh, regression analysis that Selim didn't have time to show, they showed that the uh, effect is more pronounced in the regions where, which was already uh, experiencing high house price growth. Okay, so what I take out of this thing, first of all, I find uh, this analysis a novel and a timely analysis contributing to the recent discussions about both the effectiveness of macroprudential policies and the distributional effects of macroprudential policies. When it comes to the distributional uh, effects of macroprudential policies intermediated through the housing market, we have only a handful of papers. Uh, two of them, one of them is a recent paper by Gerald Chari and the co-authors published in Journal of Finance and uh, Jose Luis Pedro and the co-authors uh, published in uh, 2023, just published, I think, in September in Rio Financial Studies. The first one for uh, using Irish data, the second one using the UK data. The paper considers, within all these constraints, uh, carefully what may be the demand factors and supply factors at the, uh, at the municipal level and also uh, regional level time varying heterogeneity. And the results provide encouraging results in the sense that the macroprudential tightening may tame the housing price fluctuations. Um, all we have so far uh, uh, are mostly the cross-country analysis. Uh, for example, paper by uh, Ken Katrin and Ilyok Shim or uh, uh, Eugenia Gerutti, Stein Kleissens, Luke Levan. All we have mostly is uh, the, uh, the cross-country analysis. So using the data for Belgium, the paper suggests that the macroprudential tightening uh, may lead to slowdown in the housing growth. And um, it may motivate us further to understand whether and how to design and implement further macroeconomic policies uh, if, if there is any uh, inequality issues uh, as a result. But let me share some of my observations and suggestions. Um, if the questions about the effectiveness of the uh, uh, borrower-based macroprudential policies, okay, I used to be at the central bank, I'm the first thing I would be asked was, okay, uh, first show us whether this led to a slowdown in the uh, credit growth, mortgage loan origination, or maybe higher cost of borrowing for the, for the individual. So the paper um, directly focuses on the house price dynamics. But in my opinion, to give a better narrative and to give a complete picture about the transmission mechanism, uh, we need some more in terms of whether this tightening uh, lead to changes in the credit conditions. And um, ideally, like Acharya and others' paper or Pedro and others' paper, this, uh, the paper would uh, benefit from loan-level data. I don't know. Uh, very much about the Belgium data, but the municipal level data uh, e that we have here um, may be silent. I'm still, I will have some suggestions, but um, the ideal thing would be, I think, to use the loan level data and to first address if these tightening lead to changes in the credit conditions. And another big question is, I mean, the, the macroprudential uh, micro policy actions are about also changing the risk uh, composition. Here we observe that the areas with the um, high risk households are facing differential extra slowdown in the housing prices in response to the macroprudential tightening. But we don't know whether it is a change in the price or whether it's some sort of a decomposition where the banks now are preferring uh, uh, relocating uh, mortgage loans to, let me say, less risky uh, borrowers. So we don't have this thing in the paper. And from the policy perspective, it's an important thing, I think, to observe if the macroprudential policy leads to some sort of changes in the composition of the risks. And even without the loan level data, I think the paper can still uh, make use of things like um, I, as far as I understand, uh, there, there is the municipal level data about the growth of housing transactions, growth of mortgage uh, credits. Still, the paper, before uh, starting with the 
housing price maybe uh, can show how the housing uh, transactions and mortgage credits respond and whether that's, that response is differential with respect to riskiness in the municipalities. Some further observations and comments. Um, uh, the, the empirical specification here, I wrote here one year, but instantaneous impact, the, the, the empirical specif specification assumes. But uh, Lara and Selin has another paper with a cross-country analysis in which what I observe is the, anal the, the effect, significant effect starts from four to six quarters, but the main effect goes beyond four to quarters. So maybe it may be good to reconcile the leg structure or the outside leg uh, of the policy. Um, uh, okay, there are some economic things maybe I can share during the coffee break, for example, uh, and some of them has been fixed in the uh, slides compared to the earlier version. But one thing also linking to a discussion yesterday, the paper starts with all saturated fixed effects, but I think the nice thing would be to remove, let's say, municipal fixed effects, uh, other things, and to see how these things, for example, the share of uh, high-risky individuals in the region are correlated with the house prices and then introduce the fixed effects one by one. Um, so um, there are some other comments. I think for the sake of time, I can comment, uh, give these things during the thing. In very short uh, uh, summary, it's a timely paper. It's a novel paper in an area where there's still a knowledge gap. And the paper has potential to contribute to the recent discussions on the effectiveness of macroprudential policies uh, and also the dynamics of housing wealth inequality. But in my opinion, there's a clear potential to benefit from more granular data at the loan level, uh, uh, which, which would tell us uh, more about what really the transmission mechanism is at the end of which we observe house price responses. Thank you so much. Thanks very much to both. So um, you will have the chance to answer the questions. We can take maybe one comment. And Eugene was the first, so. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It's uh, very timely, very useful. Um, I'm a believer in micro approaches, so, so this is indeed very timely. Uh, one quick comment is whether, you know, in the same way as you looked at the quantile, with the quantile approach at hot versus cold, have you considered or you could consider spatial dependence models in which basically, you know, the municipalities actually may have some interaction effects with the neighboring municipalities because people may also live in one work in the other and they may also influence the uh, demand for temporary housing across uh, various municipalities. And a bit more provocatively, also uh, having in mind what Marco yesterday commented in terms of, okay, we go to borrower-based measures for, for NFCs and, and the order of magnitude in, in terms of, you know, complications for calibrations. What does this mean? What, what what would this mean, in your opinion, for for calibrating, you know, borrower-based measures, for example, um, and at a more local level? So, thanks very much. If we can allow for one other one, there was the lady over there. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jan Erdenova from the Danish Central Bank. I have a different policy question. So, in your paper, you combine the capital-based measures with the borrower-based measures. Um, I was wondering if you've considered uh, having them separate, uh, basically, because uh, in the literature otherwise uh, there seems to be a very different effect uh, from capital-based measures compared to borrower-based. Capital-based measures are generally not considered to be having any impact on prices or uh, these dynamics, whereas borrower-based measures are considered really effective with a large pass-through. Uh, and also having these um, dummy type of variables, it seems that the pass-through from the measures you consider are the same. Um, also, uh, along the same line, it seems that the borrower-based measures were introduced at the end of the period that you're considering. So I was just wondering whether the results could be interpreted as only the effects from the capital-based measures and not so much from the borrower-based measures. Um, and just finally, I was wondering if you've considered to include other policies that might have an effect on, uh, um, on, uh, on the results that you get in the sample. For example, throughout this period, a lot of capital regulation is being phased in. So how do you distinguish between other types of uh, capital regulation and the macroprudential measures? And also, is there any changes in the tax uh, system that would also impact uh, prices? Thank you. Or Celine, please be concise. 
Okay, um, concerning the question of spillover effects, um, we've gotten this question uh, quite a lot already before. Uh, the short answer is that at this moment we don't take that into account, but if there is a way to do that, we would definitely want to because we could think about sizable spillover effects. Um, just looking at the data, we know that uh, people in Belgium don't tend to move that often and that far away uh, from their uh, parents' house, but still this is a limited and very restrictive assumption. Um, concerning your question on what that would entail for uh, calibrating um, yeah, firm measures at the local level, um, yeah, I think it's it's already quite complicated to take into account all the different segments of the housing markets with young people, first-time borrowers, um, buy-to-let investors, and so on. Uh, that's manageable uh, in terms of policy, uh, but I agree with the discussion of yesterday that in terms of firms, there's even a lot more heterogeneity uh, beyond the location, and that's we, we are typically focusing in this paper on the location of housing markets as a driving um, measure of segmented markets. Um, and then concerning the questions, uh, yeah, there are a lot of questions, very interesting. Um, I cannot answer all of them, I guess. Um, the thing is that we've indeed uh, combined capital-based measure with borrower-based measures. The, yeah, the, the main reason to do so is because there aren't that many uh, measures being undertaken. Our idea is to get an update of the data. Uh, we are waiting for this uh, hedonic house price index. Then we have an additional observation of changes in uh, capital-based measures in Belgium, and maybe then we can limit it to the capital-based measure. Uh, we can estimate them separately, but at this moment it seems that we don't have a sufficient amount of observations, which is always the issue in empirical work relating to uh, macrodential measures. Uh, but we are thinking about that, so thank you for the suggestions. Other measures at this point have not been taken into account because we really wanted to focus on those measures implemented to address um, yeah, the resilience to and the volatility in housing markets. But we can take that into account because we do have them from our other work. Okay, thank you very much, Celine and uh, Sona. So let's move now to the second uh, paper in the session, again on housing markets. And I would give the floor to Alexandra Varadi. She's senior research economist at the Bank of England and has a research interest mainly in the household behavior and housing market um, area and uh, the paper will be discussed by Christoph Basten from the University of Zurich where he is assistant professor of banking and is working on macroprudential capital requirements among other topics. Hello everyone, um, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to present my work today. Um, so the work I'm going to present today is uh, joined with uh, my colleague Bruno Albuquerque uh, who's a an economist at the IMF, um, and the usual disclaimers apply um, in that the views in this paper represent only our own and um, not the views of the Bank of England or, or the IMF. Um, so I wanted to just start by um, setting out our, our kind of research questions for, for this paper. So the aim of this paper is to try to examine the ability of mortgage payment holidays that were introduced in the UK during the COVID-19 pandemic to help um, support household consumption. And we have three key questions that uh, we're interested in answering in this paper. So first, we want to understand if mortgage payment holidays have been accessed by the households who need them the most. Um, then we want to understand how um, have mortgage payment holidays actually supported the consumption dynamics of, of the mortgagors. Um, and then third, we're interested in the distributional impact. So we want to understand if mortgage payment holidays have been more potent for those households facing um, uh, threats to their financial resilience. Um, and the motivation for this paper is twofold. So um, first, we want to contribute to the literature on the effect of govern government policies on households. Um, so existing research in this space, so in the space of kind of um, policies that offer temporary liquidity constraint to households, um, has been mainly focused on policies such as direct cash stimulus or tax rebates in the US. Um, the impact of mortgage payment holidays per se um, on, on kind of consumption in recessions has not been studied um, um, to, to our knowledge. Um, the policies have been implemented in, in some, some other form in the US as well. 
But in the US, um, existing work during COVID has been focused on the impact of these policies on mortgage defaults rather than on, on spending patterns. The paper that's most similar to ours um, is by Viviala in 2019, uh, who does study the impact of mortgage payment holidays in Finland in 2015, but the implementation of these policies in Finland were very different to what we observed in the UK. So um, in, in Finland, borrowers were still liable to pay uh, to make interest repayments, while in the UK we had a complete stop to, to both capital and interest repayments during the recession. In Finland, the economy was still in a boom when the policy was introduced, um, whereas in, in the UK, we, we considered the, the impact of a policy during a, a, a large aggregate negative shock. Um, and in Finland, the, the policy was offered by one lender only, whereas in the UK, it was completely nationwide. Our second motivation for this paper is, is obviously for policy. Um, during the last financial crisis in 2007 to 2008, arrears of mortgagors increased drastically um, and um, spending particularly of highly indebted households decreased substantially, which um, led to kind of amplifying the negative shocks of the uh, of the of the crisis. Um, however, during the COVID pandemic, with mortgage moratoria in place, and of course with other government policies um, uh, to, to support the real economy, um, we have seen arrears remaining low. So then there is a, an important question of whether mortgage payment holidays can be used um, uh, during an, an aggregate negative um, kind of shock to deal with an aggregate negative shock, um, and uh, whether policymakers should consider this, this policy going forward. Um, so I wanted to spend some time um, just on um, kind of explaining how this policy was implemented in the UK during the COVID-19 pandemic. So as I mentioned, it was a, a nationwide government policy that was introduced in March 2020. It offered an initial break for three months, which was then extended to, to six months in June 2020, and it offered a complete stop in both capital and interest repayments. It was free and easy to apply for the policy, um, and the government um, kind of um, told uh, households that there would be no consequences to their credit scores. Um, approximately 20% of all mortgagors in the UK took a mortgage payment holiday, and the majority of these payment holidays were extended at the start of the pandemic. The chart um, here shows both the flow and the stock of mortgage payment holidays. Um, and as you can see by the, by the red line, um, the majority of mortgage payment holidays have been um, extended between March and, and May 2020. Um, the stock had, had slowly grown. Um, up to a peak of around 17%, uh, which was reached around May 2020, and then it kind of slightly um, uh, started to, to, to decrease. Um, so I wanted to, to kind of spend some time on um, the data that we use in this paper. So um, the data that we use comes from a mobile app called Money Dashboard. The app provides um, a free real-time account aggregator for users that collects all users' daily transactions um, from their current accounts, credit accounts, and savings accounts within one single platform. It includes information on the user's age, gender, and postcode, and from the data that we have, we're also able to estimate the presence of kids. Um, so in terms of kind of um, the sources of funds for, for the users, we are able to observe income, um, and we're able to observe whether this comes from salary, whether it is rental income, financial income, or comes from benefits, including government benefits. And we're also able to observe um, unsecured debt finance. So this is kind of personal loan finance, for instance, coming into users' accounts. Um, on how users actually use their funds, um, we, can, we can observe spending at the very, very granular level that we then kind of aggregate into, into different buckets. Um, we can observe cash withdrawals, payments into investment accounts, rental payments, mortgage repayments, as well as unsecured debt repayments. After cleaning, um, we have around 13,000 distinct users, which we can observe on a monthly basis from January 2019 until November 2020. Um, so we do a lot of um, testing in the in the paper to try to show that um, this transaction level data that we get from money dashboard is indeed representative of mortgage ors. Um, so on this slide, I just plotted two of our um, kind of key charts showing how uh, representative the data is. So starting with the, the chart on the right, um, 
that plots the percentage of users in Money Dashboard who are mortgagors and compares that with two other sources um, from um, the government. One that comes straight from, from the government, Family Resource Survey in the UK, and one that comes from the Office of National Statistics. And you can see that um, Money Dashboard does a really good job of, at identifying those households who are indeed mortgagors, so for whom we, we can observe um, uh, a, a monthly mortgage payment. Where Money Dashboard is not that good is at identifying which households are renters and which households are outright owners. And that's kind of understandable because um, transaction level data sets like Money Dashboard um, use an algorithm to try to tag transactions and to, to try to, to um, kind of um, identify where, where those are rental payments or, or mortgage payments. And it's quite hard to identify rental payments because those are essentially just transactions between two different households. Um, and it's quite hard to know whether there's just payments for random um, spending or whether that's the trending. However, for the purpose of our uh, paper, um, we, we, don't, we don't necessarily uh, put a lot of weight on that because we do focus in this paper on mortgagors uh, and we bucket everyone else, renters and outright owners, into, into one category. Um, the chart on, on the left um, plus the distribution of income for mortgagors in Money Dashboard um, alongside um, data from the Office of National Statistics in the UK. And you can see that um, the distribution is actually not that bad. Um, so with the exception of uh, one of the tails, um, Money Dashboard does a, does a pretty good job at identifying kind of um, income uh, in, uh, across the data. Um, so I wanted to kind of um, spend a bit of time on how we identify mortgage payment holidays in Money Dashboard, and that's because we don't have a, a dummy variable that switches from zero to one if a mortgage payment is missing from the data, and, and that's because of payment holidays or something else. So in order to identify mortgage payment holidays in the data, we have an, an algorithm in, in three steps. So in step one, we identify consistent mortgage payments. That is mortgage payments that we can observe on a monthly basis across multiple months. Um, and that's because sometimes households um, make um, early repayments, for instance, they are very sporadic um, and, and kind of a, of different amounts. And we want to make sure that we don't tag those as, as monthly, uh, as, as kind of mortgage payment holidays. Then um, in step two, we identify a, a missing payment as a mortgage payment holiday if it's missing from March 2020 when the policy was introduced, but it was observed previously, or if, if it had been missing for a few months prior to March 2020, but it then resumed later in, in 2020. And the idea um, is here to try to capture households on arrears as well. So at the very start of the pandemic, the government allowed households who were in arrears prior to the pandemic to also jump onto mortgage payment holidays because it was more beneficial for their credit scores. We wanted to capture those uh, those mortgages as well. And then third, we, we have to, to kind of see the payments resume by November 2020 when our when our data finishes. Um, the, the chart here compare, shows the stock of mortgage payment holidays that we identify with this algorithm from March 2020 until October 2020. And it plots uh, the stock of mortgage payment holidays in Money Dashboard against data from UK Finance. So the UK Finance is a, a body in the UK um, that provide, provided during the pandemic aggregated um, data on mortgage payment holidays from a sample of, of lenders. Um, and as you can see, we, we, we do quite well um, with our algorithm in identifying mortgage payment holidays that it's kind of very representative for what the lenders, lenders themselves are, uh, were um, saying at the time. Um, so moving on to, to kind of to analysis, um, one thing we wanted to, to look at um, in this paper is to, to kind of try to understand who were the mortgagors who access mortgage payment holidays. And in order to do that, we run a probit um, regression on the sample of mortgagors, where we were trying to understand um, the correlations between the probability of getting a, a mortgage payment holidays and household characteristics. And in terms of household characteristics, we consider households' um, financial position prior to the pandemic. So we look at households' debt service ratios prior to the pandemic, their savings rates prior to the pandemic, whether they had financial income going, going into the pandemic or not, whether they had unsecured credit entering the pandemic, and the number of mortgages that they made on a monthly basis prior to the pandemic. 
We also look at the financial position during the pandemic. So we look at whether uh, their income has changed at the very start of the pandemic relative to, to the, the, the months before. Um, and we look at whether households were made unemployed uh, at, the, at the very start of the, the pandemic um, compared to their, their status prior. We also look at household characteristics. So um, we look at whether households have kids and, and uh, we, we also put age through the, to the regression. So what we find here is that um, there is a higher probability of policy take up if um, households are were entering the, um, the crisis with existing financial vulnerabilities and in particular with high debt service ratios or, or low savings rates. And this is somewhat um, expected. We also find that um, for households experiencing negative income shocks at the start of the pandemic, um, they were also much more likely and they had a higher probability of policy take up and they were much more likely to have to have a mortgage payment holiday for a period longer than three months. Um, what is interesting with uh, with this analysis is that um, mortgage payment holidays didn't go just to the people who were most um, um, kind of financially strained. It also went to people with the um, with the with a better um, kind of financial position. So we find that households who had a positive financial income um, entering the pandemic, as well as households who were more likely to be property investors, so who had second and, and third homes, they were also much more um, probable to have um, a, a mortgage payment holidays com compared to the households with other characteristics. Um, so moving on, um, we we kind of we we want to understand. Um, okay, so for households who had mortgage payment holidays, would 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 the policy actually do to their spending patterns? And in order to answer this question, um, we um, apply a difference in difference approach. As shown in the in the regression in, in the slides, so um, we um, regress the year on year change in the logarithm of real non housing consumption on a number of controls that I'll explain in, in a minute um, and on a dummy for um, whether households had a mortgage payment holiday or not. Also interacting that dummy with uh, with some household characteristics that again, I'll, I'll go through in a, in a minute. So. Um, the, the coefficient of interest here is beta zero, which captures the difference in average consumption due to mortgage payment holidays between the treated and the control group. Um, and the, the kind of um, the, the main issue with this uh, with this regression is that it's it could be very prone to both self-selection into policy because the policy was offered to, to all the mortgagors in the UK. But there's also many sources of non-randomness that we try to, to control for. So first, we try to address these issues by choosing the control group to be the non-eligible for the policy. So renters and outright owners would be will, will be our control group. The reason why we don't choose mortgagors who, who um, are never on mortgage payment holidays to be our control group is particularly because of self-selection. So the policy was offered to everyone, but only 20% actually chose to, to take, take it up. Um, which means that there, there could be many unobserved factors amongst mortgagors that may determine policy, um, uh, the probability of, of policy take up, which we are unable to, to control for. And one example here is financial literacy. So although the, the policy was very um, highly advertised across um, many different media outlets, it's still possible, according to the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK, that a, a, a big chunk of mortgagors didn't know that it existed, so they, they never applied for it. This is not something that we can we can um, control for, but this would be something that would bias our um, our um, estimators if we were to, to kind of um, choose mortgagors as our control group. Um, we then include a wide range of fixed effects um, and other controls into the regression. So we control for time varying income um, as well as for um, changes in income for households at the very start of the pandemic relative to the, to the months before. This is um, what, what, what's in the slides um, labeled as income shocks. But we also include fixed effects for households, region, country, postcode and, and time. And then finally, we do a wide range of robustness checks just to make sure that um, our estimators say, remain consistent. Um, so um, 
the 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 first thing that we do is we um, test two alternative identification strategies for our co coefficients of interest. I won't have time to go through them in, in a lot of detail in this presentation, but I just wanted to, to mention them here. So the first one is synthetic control methods, uh, where um, we, you know, the, the control group is computed by um, weighing, weighing up the control units that uh, mostly resemble the treated units in terms of the consumption um, patterns prior to the pandemic. The second um, alternative approach is propensity score matching, where we match controls and treated units based on observables, many observables, um, and um, compare it to kind of um, outcomes for, for treated and, 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 and those controls that, that match the treated units the best. Um, we also try um, a robustness check where we use mortgagors who are never on mortgage payment holidays as controls just to see if our results would be wildly different if we were to choose that, um, that control group despite our um, self-selection um, issues. And we also allow for anticipation and delayed effects. So we allow the policy to, we allow households to anticipate the policy and, and start making changes to their consumption prior to actually accessing the policy, as well as to, to kind of delay the effects of, of, of the policy. None of these um, um, robustness checks change um, our estimated coefficients. They remain very, very robust to kind of all of these approaches. Um, so kind of moving on to results. Um, so starting with um, kind of column one, the first thing to note here is that mortgage payment holidays did not are not statistically significant for the average mortgagor. So the average mortgagor on major, on on um, uh, mortgage payment holidays did not increase their spend or did, did not benefit from from higher consumption just because they they um, 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 kind of used the policy. Um, however, when we look into the sample of mortgagors who are liquidity constrained. The, the results change. And we do capture liquidity constraints in, in various ways. So in column two, we include a dummy uh, variable that equals to one if households are in the, um, in the lower quintile for their savings rates. In column three, we include the savings rates uh, linearly in the regression. And in column four, we include a dummy variable for whether households um, are in the in the kind of bottom quintile for the income distribution. And for all of these, um, we get um, um, kind of positive and, and significant um, impact of, of the policy. In column five, uh, we also look at um, whether households who have withstand a negative income shock at the start of the pandemic um, consume um, more relative to, to the control group uh, who had suffered from, from similar uh, income shocks. And, and uh, once again, we, we get a, a, a positive impact of the policy. Now, the, um, the specification that we, we most like um, is the one presented in column seven that um, kind of says the, the, the following things. First, amongst households who are more likely to be liquidity constrained, so those in the bottom quintile of, of the savings rate, um, those mortgagors who were on mortgage payment holidays benefited, for benefited from a consumption growth that was around 22% higher than the control group with similar liquidity constraints. Um, and um, we, uh, the second result is that um, amongst households who um, um, suffered from a 10% negative income shock at the start of the pandemic, Mortgagors who were on mortgage payment holidays benefited from consumption growth that was 0.3% higher than control group with similar um, kind of income shocks at the start of the pandemic. Um, I, I just wanted to quickly highlight that uh, our results stay the same with one of our alternative um, uh, approaches, um, identification approaches, um, and I'm I, I've shown here the, the propensity score matching. So as you as you probably know, um, the, the propensity score matching is done in two stages. In stage one, we estimate the probability of policy take up across treated and non-eligible, given a wide range of observables. And then in stage two, we match treated and controls based on propensity scores using the nearest neighbor estimator. Um, the, the first row um, shows the impact the average impact across the sample. And once again, you see that there's no statistical significance effect of the policies. But when we look at the sample of liquidity constrained households only, then um, 
propensity score results plotted in column one and two are very, very similar to results that we get uh, using our uh, different diff baseline showed in, in column three. Um, and before I, I finish, I just wanted to, to kind of um, um, show the, the answer to the question of kind of, you know, mortgage payment holidays have not been targeted in the UK. They've been offered to, to all households um, with different um, financial resilience. So what did households who were not liquidity constraints, who, who didn't have um, important financial resilience risks, what did they do with, with mortgage payment holidays? And to, to answer this question, we um we do the um the we kind of rerun the regression the different diff regression that um I've, I've just presented um but instead of um having consumption growth as a dependent variable we have the savings rate and um this is plotted in column two uh with column one showing the different diff results when consumption growth is is used as a dependent variable and as you can see for the average mortgageor consumption hasn't changed but the sa their savings rates have increased considerably um, and amongst the liquidity constrained households, it was only consumption that was um, statistically um, kind of um, affected by by the policy with with their savings rates um, uh, not not increasing in a, or not changing in a statistical way. Um, so to conclude, um, in this paper, we use rich transaction level data to investigate the effect of government policies on mortgageors. We use many robustness checks um, and controls to eliminate many sources of bias, including from, uh, from self-selection, um, from the broader effects of the pandemic, um, and uh, from um, different government policies that were um, used at the time to support households. We find that mortgage payment holidays have been used by households with varying degrees of financial strength, including by, by property investors. Um, but we, we find that payment holidays did not lead the average mortgageor um, to change their consumption. Instead, the policy supported consumption of households with low savings rates, um, which are more likely to be liquidity constrained, and this is robust to, to many model specifications. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, read and discuss this exciting paper. Um, okay, I will provide a very brief summary, just two slides, and then I have up to six comments, depending on uh, how much time I have. I hope some of them are useful. Okay, um, brief summary. So the office evaluate um, UK mortgage moratoria where during the pandemic uh, households could pause repaying the interest and repaying the principal of the mortgage. And they look at three, um, in my reading, they look at sort of three outcomes. First, they look at who takes up, who uses this policy. Second, for those who do use it, uh, how does it affect their consumption growth? And if they don't uh, consume it, then obviously the alternative is savings. So how does it affect their savings rate? Um, they use uh, transaction level data from the UK's biggest aggregator app called Money Dashboard. And I see two key findings. One is um, the payment holidays do allow the liquidity constrained households to smooth their consumption. The other thing is the payment holidays are also used by households who are not liquidity constrained. And then we have to discuss is that a loss somehow of efficiency or does it not matter? The basic methodology is diff and diff. So they have an interact interaction between a dummy for using the payment holiday and between different measures of liquidity constraints. Okay, that's my summary. Now, what comments do I have? Um, the first one is when it comes to measuring effectiveness, um, they use different measures of income shocks and they use different measures of debt. I would have uh, used the debt service ratio, somehow the, the ratio between the two, because if you're low income, if you have low savings, arguably that doesn't matter much if you don't have much debt or maybe you have super high debt, but it doesn't matter much because you have an income to back it, right? So I would use uh, the debt service ratio. Also, I would not use it just pre-pandemic and pre-payment holidays. I was thinking of using the, how the DSR changes over the pandemic if you have an income shock. So you have the debt before, 
when your income is shocked and how does it fa that affect your take up and the treatment uh, of a payment holiday? Obviously, one problem potentially is that it's endogenous. It could be that if you have a big mortgage, uh, maybe you work harder to not have your income drop. Maybe if you can afford it, um, you say, well, I, I, I work less. So I was thinking, is there a way to instrument the income shock? And some things I thought of is, could you look at the sector of employment? I understand you don't have the data. I, I guess in the app you see income coming in. So I don't know if you can look at the text and see where the employer is. But what I understand you do have is the postcode. So the region could maybe be used as an instrument uh, for once different regions were differently affected by the pandemic. They had different sectors, right? So a region where there's a lot of uh, hotels and restaurants might be affected more. Maybe that makes you lose your job. If you work in IT or research, maybe it doesn't. Um, the other thing is um, the region might affect who else takes up uh, the payment holiday. So there is this paper by Guizo, Sapienza and Zingales showing that if you have more peers in the US who default on their mortgages, that also makes you more likely to default. So here it could be peer effect, it could be no knowing about the uh, payment holiday. So you write, um, there's only 20% take up, maybe not everyone knows about it. But if you are in a region where many others use that opportunity, maybe you're more likely to take it up. So that's my first comment. Um, relatedly, um, so you say you can't use the non uh, the, the other mortgages as control group, and you discuss who takes up uh, um, the policy, and you do find that it's more likely to be used by those with higher ex ante debt service ratios, and I think that's very good. Um, yeah, and as I just said, I, I think I would also look at um, the regions where people live, and I would not only look at a realized unemployment shocks, but also at unemployment shock risk. So I would imagine if you work in uh, in hotel or restaurants, you're more likely to lose your job. So even if you don't observe people losing their job, I would still think they might, for example, take up a payment holiday and save more because they are anticipating that they might lose their job. Okay, third point of interest is the control group. Um, so you're right, you don't use existing mortgages as control group. Um, I understand from some of the text that you used that earlier, and you, you also say said in the presentation you use that as a robustness check. So the main control group you use is renters and outright owners. I was a bit surprised that you say that um, only 30% in your uh, sample borrow, because the home ownership, as I understand, is about 60% in the UK. I googled it, I found some slightly higher numbers, 38%, but what I was wondering is um, if there's so many homeowners in the UK and only half of them are mortgagers, I take it that people repay faster. So I, I'm, I'm more used to the Swiss or Dutch setup uh, where people just don't repay for tax reasons. But if people repay fast, that's maybe an opportunity because maybe you can look at mortgages who have repaid a year or two ago. It's still the same kind of household who buys a home, who takes up debt, but maybe if they have repaid last year, that helps. Um, I, so there's cross-sectional differences, obviously for different if you're interested in uh, the trends. Um, the trends are parallel in your graphs uh, before the treatment. They also look pretty parallel to me after the treatment. So I was wondering, are you plotting the right outcome? And for so I, as I see it, you plot, um, you plot consumption levels, which are parallel ex ante, but in the regression you use consumption growth. So I would also plot pre-trends for consumption growth and see how parallel these are. Maybe they are not entirely, that's fine, but then you just want to discuss it. Okay. Um, yeah, there's one issue of the extent to which the app captures all transactions of a household or whether there's accounts that are not linked. Uh, I'll skip that. But uh, the second point is how selective is the app use? You say uh, it is representative of the population. I would still think maybe it's more the young uh, or, or uh, the more educated who use it. Um, and, and maybe uh, you want to discuss if there is any are any biases. I don't think that 
uh, makes the, the paper wrong, but maybe that means that your estimates are, if anything, upper or lower bound. So I think in that way, it could be useful to discuss that. Um, outcomes, you say you drop cash because you don't know what people do with it and you drop untech debit transactions, I would have included both. I would have thought it's unlikely that people would draw a lot of cash and put it under their pillow. I think most cash will be used for consumption. I would just have included cash and uh, untech debit transactions as consumptions. Okay, the final thing worth discussing is the interpretation. Um, so you said the FCA, the regulator, uh, recommended that banks give payment holidays. But I was wondering what are the incentives uh, for the banks to do so? So I imagine um, maybe they think that reduces the default risk if those who can't afford to pay get a, get a holiday. Maybe they get goodwill because the, 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 the mortgages say, well, I like my bank because it, uh, it helps me. Um, so I was wondering, is there any cost? Um, that's the third point. Is there any cost? of take up of non liquidity constraint also so when there's an outright subsidy or if they don't have to ever repay obviously there's a huge cost if it's just paused um i suppose the banks lose some interest i wasn't clear from that if if like i pay repay six months later do i have to pay more interest i guess in a low rate period that's not a lot of cost um I guess liquidity, if, if banks are li have liquidity risk because the payment comes later, probably they, there's other measures to capture that, but it would be good to discuss whether there's any cost to the take up by non-liquidity constraints or whether that's totally fine. Uh, last point I want to talk about is, is point two. I was really wondering what are the effects of the payment holidays after the pandemic? So what you do discuss is um how does consumption change just the month after the payment holiday but if you have the data i would find it very interesting to see what do they do a year or two after the pandemic because after the payment holiday they might still be worried that the pandemic might get worse they might still want to do more saving but i would find it interesting what do they do like a year afterwards um, that's the main points um and uh, yeah, thanks for the exciting paper and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing a future version of it too. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can take a number of uh, questions. I have one over here and there. Hello, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if you have a, a sense of how many of the people who could benefit from this policy actually took it up. So kind of to reverse the, the, the regressions a little bit, because I think that's really important from a, from a policy perspective. Thank you very much for the very interesting paper that uses novel uh, kind of data. I wonder if you took that extra step. You said that uh, liquidity constrained uh, borrowers are mostly uh, uh, mostly smooth their consumption after this payment holiday. I was wondering whether you did or would aggregate the effects of, of both liquidity constrained and unconstrained and estimate the total impact of, of consumption. And, and talking about uh, the wider uh, costs of this payment holidays in terms of what the discussant uh, discussed, I was wondering, you know, is this payment holiday as an ex post macro prudential measure a panacea basically it's the way i think about it is supporting credit avoiding a credit crunch and also uh supporting consumption but during the corona crisis the banks were basically not liquidity constrained so you're basically supporting liquidity constrained households but banks do have liquidity. What in other? What about in other cases when when banks are themselves liquidity constrained? So what would uh, that kind of larger macroeconomic effects entail? Would there be a a, a, a a credit crunch, or not? So that's just a general idea. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, then uh, over to you, Alexandra. Um, thank you very much, Christian, for your for your comments as, as well as um, for the questions. I'll I'll start with the questions if if that's okay. Um, so the the kind of um, 
the first question, which I think it's, it's very interesting, is how many people actually um, took the, the policy um, amongst all the liquidity constraints. Um, so in money dashboard, about a half, but we don't know in reality. And I think that's that's kind of, um, that that's quite important. We do show that the data is representative, but um, it's just kind of um, a sample of the, of the data that we see, so 13,000 households. So it's quite hard to aggregate that at the, at the kind of national level to see how um, how many actually benefited. But in, in Money Dashboard, we see that about a half of the people who were liquidity constrained actually took the mortgage payment holidays in so benefit to, to consumption. Um, the reason why others may not have taken the mortgage payment holidays is, um, as, I, as I mentioned in my slides, um, very likely financial literacy. So there is a paper from the a Financial Conduct Authority that looked at um, different characteristics of household or of mortgagors during the pandemic and has found that um, around 20 to 30 percent of those who would have benefited from the policy didn't actually use the policy because they they just didn't they just weren't aware that it was there and it was based on a on a essentially survey data um so we think that although it was it was very um it was very much advertised across the uk it's just um, didn't reach everyone um, and then in terms of this, the second question about the total impact on consumption, we, we, we take that, I think we think it's, it's very important is just um, the data that we, we had uh, didn't allow us at the time to, to study this effect, but it's, um, it, 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 it's, it's a very important one and it's the one that most matters for macroprudential policy, particularly in the UK, given that we say that um, one purpose of um, macroprudential housing tools in the UK is to avoid this aggregate demand externality is the fact that um, highly indebted households tend to pull back from consumption a lot more in, in uh, bad times, amplifying effects. Um, so we, we don't have a way of, of answering that at the moment. We are trying to get updated data from, uh, from Money Dashboard in order to try to assess the longer term impact of consumption on households. Now, one thing that we do in the paper is we look at what happens at the expiration date. So um, for um, households, um, on, on both three months and, and six months for which we can observe the data, the expiration date, what we do is um, we say, okay, in the in the two or three months following the expiration date, do they, you know, their consumption, um, is that still positive or negative? And what we find is that for households on three months mortgage payment holidays, um, there are no statistical significant effects of consumption. So essentially they, they consume more while the policy is active, but then when at the, the expiration date, that there's no statistical significant of, of spending anymore. Um, however, for households on six months mortgage payment holidays, we do find that they tend to over consume during the, the while the, the policy is active and they tend to under consume at the end. So we see a, a statistical um, negative effect in terms of consumption at the, in, in the two to three months following the expiration date. And we think that's mainly because um, households who are on longer mortgage payment holidays, they tend to be correlated with income shocks as well. So they're, they're, they tend to be the ones um, that have suffered a large negative income shock at the very start of the pandemic. So they are um, they are even more kind of financially um, in a, in a in a difficult financial place, um, in addition to kind of having no no savings raised to, to deal with the pandemic, so they need a little bit longer to uh, to 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 have the mortgage payment holiday for. But they also might be the ones who are most constrained and they're not able to to consume optimally. So they essentially increase consumption while the policy is there, but then they have to to pull back from consumption at the end of the at the end of the policy. Um, and I don't know if I have time to answer the yes. Um, so just to answer a couple of um, of comments from from Christoph. Um, so one is on the sample selection. Uh, so you mentioned that um, it's it's on one hand it's a bit unclear or what what household is in 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 the context of our paper. And what we do is we use the concept of nuclear family. So we assume that some users um, may um, Kind of tag their partners' accounts into their own um, app, um, and that is their decision. And if they do that, then we kind of take the household as a given. For households who don't do that, and kind of their, the, we just we see only one user's um, accounts, then then we just take it as given. Um, it's not it's not the best approach, but we decided to to kind of um, to take all the data that we have rather than kind of cut and say we're only looking at sing single household. Um, 
single households um, instead. Um, in terms of um, the data being slightly biased, that's that's a fair point. So the data is when we look at the whole households, um, money dashboard is biased towards young and educated people, mostly residing in London and the South. However, when we look at the distribution across mortgagors, this bias is not necessarily there because mortgagors in the UK tend to be younger, educated and residing in London. So that, so that, that is why we kind of focus our, our analysis on mortgagors rather than kind of looking at households as, as a whole. Um, and in terms of, of kind of the, the interpretation, um, you asked about the incentives of banks of, of doing so. I mean, we have some bankers in the audience, so maybe they can uh, chip in as well. But um, as, as far as, as, as we've seen as, as regulators, um, it's, it's mainly because of defaults. So defaults are very costly um, in the UK and, and elsewhere. And being able to just help households, whether through a, a health shock that was in kind of no way um, their own, but you know their own fault, sounded cheaper than than kind of letting them default. And indeed, during the financial crisis, mortgage moratoria weren't in place in the UK. Many households did indeed default, um, um, and there was a, a notable impact on consumption um, as well. So, kind of trying to avoid that that loop um, seemed way less costly via mortgage moratoria than. Than defaults, um, and I, I think I've answered your question on the longer term impact on on the pandemic as well, which I think it's a it's a very well uh, taken point. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alexandra and Christoph. So um, it's time now for the lunch break. We will the lunch will be served outside in the foyer, um, right outside this door, and we will resume at two o'clock. But let me finish with a final applause for the four presenters and discussants today.